This slideshow discusses ancient China. Before we get started looking at the dynasties that we'll study in this session, we first need to discuss why China is significant in the first place. So about 2600 BC, that's about 5,000 years ago, there was an emperor called the Yellow Emperor. His wife's name was Lao Tzu. She was in her backyard in the garden of the palace having tea one day, hot tea, when a worm from the mulberry tree above her fell into her tea. And when she pulled the tea out with her chopsticks, there was a long line of string hanging from the worm. And this is what the Chinese credit as the discovery of silk. Now silk comes from the cocoon of the silkworm and these are worms that are found in China a few other places this is what the worm looks like and they they make this cocoon and when they emerge from the cocoon they become moss. Now they took this thread this silk thread from the silkworm and weaved it into fabric. So here's the cycle of the silkworm um, the caterpillar stage, the larva, the pupa, the adult, the moths, lay the eggs. The cycle keeps going. Now this was something that only the Chinese knew. It was a heavily guarded secret as to how uh, the silk was made. And the Chinese started trading this silk. And you see here are the looms. Um, this, is, this is a basic loom just like the ones used in ancient times where people can spin the silk into fabric. Here's a modern loom, basically the same procedure. And they guarded the secret of how silk was made for thousands of years. It was illegal to tell a foreigner how silk was made. Um, only travelers or traders were only allowed on certain outposts. They weren't allowed into China. Um, Lao Tzu is now worshiped, um, praised as the the one who discovered the silk. Here's a statue of her old silk. They would feed the worms different things to make their silk different colors and they also knew how to dye the silk. Silk is very lightweight. It's very beautiful. It can be decorated with embroidery like you see. It can be, um, you can sew beads into it, other, other fabrics. And silk is pretty much still made the same way it was made 5,000 years ago. Here's the same statue that is in China today. So the trading of the silk led to the invention of the Silk Road. The Silk Road wasn't just a road, it was a network of trading outposts that linked China all the way through India to Persia into Arabia where we have our ancient Mesopotamians and into Egypt and eventually into Europe. And this is where people would trade silk and other products back and forth. The Chinese would also trade spices. And this immense empire led to people wanting to control the land and Chinese dynasties. The first dynasty we're gonna look at is the Shang Dynasty. The Shang Dynasty was located on the um, border of the Yellow Sea. Their capital was Yin, Shangqiu is the name now. The Shang Dynasty started in 1700 BC and lasted till about 1000 BC, so about 700 years. There were 30 emperors from 17 different generations during that. Um, they're known for their artwork in jade, which is a, a stone. It's considered a precious stone, like a diamond or a ruby. Um, this is some of the architecture. You notice the, the pointed roofs, the eaves of the roof, the use of color, the use of gold, um, the use of, of um, architectural aspects. The dynasty believed in a thing called oracle bones. Basically, they would take a bone from a turtle or some other animal. They would write a question, they would gra engrave a question on the bone. And then they would take a hot, hot iron that they had heated in the fire, stab the center of the bone, and the cracks would be read by someone that you could kind of say was like a soothsayer or fortune teller. Like you would put a question like, should we go to war with our neighbor? And then they would tell you the answer. Um, here's some of our pottery. Some It's made of bronze and um, some other precious metals, copper. Here's an oracle bone. 
So whatever question was written on this, and then the poker would be put on the bone, and the cracks that would be made would be read to let the people know what they should do. Um, we have here a bronze water platoon. Um, the Shang, Shang accomplished a lot of work with bronze. They had military advances. Um, they had the horse-drawn chariot, riding, a calendar. And they had a religion that we call ancestor worship. Um, here's a bronze platoon. And what we mean by ancestor worship is that they would pray to people from their family that had died many years ago. Um, an example could be the movie Milan, the Disney cartoon. Have you seen that? In the movie, her father is called to war, and young Milan, knowing that her father's not physically capable of going, runs into the backyard where they have a, a little building set up with statues of their ancestors. She lights some incense, and she prays, asking the ancestors for help. And they try to send the dragon to help her. And instead, she gets the little puny dragon. Um, but that's a movie you can watch if you want to check out what ancestor worship. There's a scene there of her ancestors in ghost form talking. Now, we say ancestor worship, but it's not like they, they prayed to their ancestors to help them, the spirit of their ancestors. But it's not worship in the sense that they thought they were godly. Um, the Shang Dynasty was overthrown by um, King Wu of the Zhao Dynasty around 1100. Now, the Zhao Dynasty was located in pretty much the same place as the, um, as the, as the First Dynasty. Uh, some of the things we'll look at with the Zhao Dynasty, they lasted um, about 800 years. They believed in something called um, the Mandate of Heaven. They were called the Sons of Heaven. It was the long, longest lasting um, dynasty in Chinese history. Emperor Ru was the first official one. He divided the kingdoms into Western and Eastern, Zhao Dynasty. Confucius, one of the great Chinese philosophers, was born. And um, the Mandate of Heaven basically says that so long as the ruler is being fair to his people, he reserves the right to rule. So long as he is improving the life of his people, you know, his people are fed, his people are safe, his people have the supplies that they need to live the lives that they want, then he can keep in power. Um, it's kind of like a God-given right to rule. Here's a bronze bell. Here's a jade, um, like a cloak. It would be attached to fabric to hold together. This is when feudalism was developed in ancient times in China, hundreds of years before it was developed in Europe. And we have the social classes where you have the, the king or the emperor, and then he had some loyal people called nobles, and then they had the peasants that did the work. And this feudal system was used later in, e in um, Europe. We'll talk about that later. So here we have um, the first Zhao emperor. And like I said, the mandate of heaven, the gods allowed the people to rule so long as he was doing good. Well, eventually... The gods became angry at the Shang, and that's how the Zhao could overthrow them. Um, Chinese use the mandate of heaven to explain that on Nastic cycle. Now, Confucius was born in this in, during this dynasty, and Confucius was born toward the end when things were starting to fall apart. He taught social order, harmony, um, good government. He believed education was the most important. He thought that everyone should be educated. Confucius would, wrote things down that would kind of sound like things you would read in a fortune cookie. Here's a bronze piece of art. And then we have a statue of a soldier that was probably holding something at one time. Um, the Zhao time included the development of new agricultural practices. They invented coins. They standardized writing where everyone had to write the same language. They developed iron tools. And society grew very quickly. And that kind of led to their demise because people started fighting for um, power. And the fall of the Zan happened during a period called the period of warring states. And during that time, emperors were, 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 their power was taken away. They lost the mandate of heaven. And now we come to the Qin dynasty, which can also be spelled with a Q, Q-I-N. And this is the dynasty that probably gave China its name. Again, located in the same place. Now you notice on this map, we have a little portion of a wall that is starting to be built. The Qin dynasty was a, a unified imperial Qin. The first guy was emperor... Um, um, Quinshang Hadi. 
He standardized money, measurements, legal rights, writing, and he even began what would later become the Great Wall. And they built it to separate themselves from the Hans in the north, mainly. Um, he developed, they developed the imperial system of roads. He spent a lot of time creating his own tomb because he was petrified of dying and building the Great Wall. Dress was pretty much the same. We have uh, silk ropes with very large sleeves being worn during this time by the, um, by the, by the wealthy. Still using silk, still trading silk, still pr uh, protecting the secret of how silk was created. We've got some bronze artwork coming up. And then we're going to take a look at um, Shihandi's tomb. Shihandi was so petrified of death that it said that he would take an elixir every day developed by his physician. And in that elixir, it actually included mercury, which actually was killing him, even though they didn't know that at the time. So he had thousands of soldiers built. You see that? Thousands of soldiers, like uh, clay soldiers built out of clay or terracotta is another word for clay. Horses, um, chariots, cannons, everything that, that he would need to protect him in the afterlife. Now, this is also emulated in a movie. Um, that movie would be The Mummy 3, which is rated PG-13. So don't say Miss Smith told you to watch it, because I didn't. It's PG-13 for violence. Check with your parents. There's a couple cuss words. Um, but that movie has Shi Hongdi being... Um, coming back to life. And he's trying to get back to the Great Wall and finish some type of ritual that will make him live forever. Here's some of the props they made for the movie. So... The, the Shin Dynasty lasted, Chen or Quinn, however you want to say it, from 221 to 206. It was very short, 15 years, because he was a really mean guy. He was so mean, in fact, that his oldest son and his, and his second son fought after he died over the empire. His, sec, his second born son wrote a decree and, and forged the emperor's name that said that the oldest son should commit suicide so the second son can rule. And the people actually let him do it, so... Here's some images of the Great Wall, which is, of course, one of the major accomplishments of the Chinese um, people. It can be seen from space. The end of the Quinn happened around 221. Um, it was overthrown after his death. The peasants rose up against him. Lao Peng was a peasant that led one of the revolts. And that brings us to the Han Dynasty. The Han Dynasty, same area. Um, but we see on the map that it extended the wall. And the Han Dynasty lasted from 202 BC to 220 AD. So about 400 years because it crosses that, that change from BC to AD. Liu Bang is one of the main uh, most accomplished emperors. Um, he was a peasant. And he abolished restrictions on travel because before people weren't allowed to travel outside of China. He allowed all people to be educated that, that chose to. He lowered taxes on people. The taxes had been going up and up to pay for things like the wall and the tomb. And he, he kept a conscription in the army, which means people were like forced to, to join the army, kind of like the draft. And he also made people work on public projects. Now we see some, um, some bronze artwork a little more intricate it's like a full body armor and then and then we have a beautiful terracotta pot and another jade inscription with a, a dragon motif now the Han Dynasty invented paper about 100 um, BC and they also developed a way to heat China or the terracotta to where it was glazed and it was, they made it non-porous. That means that it didn't absorb water. And they also developed the wheelbarrow. Here's a stone dragon. Um, silk was still the main export. Demanded in the West. The, um, this is a seismograph. Now this is an awesome invention that was invented about two, 260 something um, AD. And inside would be a ball. And there would be rods attached to each of the dragon's head. And when there was, when it would move from a vibration of an earthquake, the rod would drop, releasing the ball. It would come out of the dragon's head and plop into the frog. And it would make a loud sound like dong. And they would know to go check it. And the direction 
of the earthquake would, would make it fall into a certain frog's mouth. So they would know where to send help. You know, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have email. They didn't have texting. They didn't even have real phones. So this would help them know, oh, there's an earthquake in this direction. And they would send help um, for the people that were living there. And then the, the Han fell because the population grew. They started having financial difficulties brought on by increasing wealth, rivalries, and a more complex um, political institution. Now, one of the big legacies of the ancient Chinese dynasties is evident in the works of Marco Polo. Marco Polo and his family traveled to China in the 1200s. This is about 400 years before other Europeans made it there. And when he came back, he was in prison because there was a war, something we don't need to go into. But while he was in prison, he had his travels written down. 